Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this FS Club webinar, Accredited Ethical Banking. Uh, my name's Ian Harris, and uh, I'm today's chairman, and I'm th thrilled to be um, hosting uh, th this particular webinar, where we will be hearing from uh, David Coe, who is the uh, chief executive of uh, the Fair Banking Foundation, and from Matt Gantley, um, who's the chief executive of UCAS, and this is a, a fabulous opportunity for us to hear from uh, both of these uh, organizations with the chief executives uh, in the same uh, virtual room. Um, I, I'd like to thank our sponsors um, initially. Uh, Morgan, you flicked through the sponsor slide. We can go back to the sponsor slide, that's all right. Um, uh, we are indebted to this uh, uh, lovely group of FS Club uh, uh, sponsor organizations for uh, our webinar program, which is uh, a, a, a varied program. But was, I was chatting with our speakers just before we started um, about how, how, how varied and interesting they find our webinar program. And we can do all of this because these uh, wonderful organizations um, have the um, uh, interest in, in the subject matter and the forbearance to, uh, uh, to enable us to um, uh, to, to run this webinar program. So a, a big, big thank you uh, to that group. Uh, Morgan, the agenda slide, um, pretty straightforward agenda. Uh, my introduction, I'm hoping, will be less than five minutes. Um, uh, then we will be hearing from David Coe uh, from the Fair Banking Foundation. And after him, uh, we'll be hearing from Matt Gantley, who's the Chief Executive of uh, UCAS, the United Kingdom Accreditation um, Service. And um, uh, we should have 15 minutes afterwards for questions and answers. And I'm hoping we'll get uh, quite a few questions in from uh, the audience uh, today. That's very often one of the most popular parts of our of our webinar programs. Um, those of you who are aching to ask questions now and will be aching to ask questions while people are, um, are talking, please use the questions uh, buttons um, within GoToWebinar. Please do not um, send us uh, emails in the background with your with your fascinating questions. We would get them, but we would get them after the webinar. Uh, we are locked in this uh, e chamber that is GoTo Webinar, and we don't see our emails until until afterwards. And there's pretty much nothing that, that we can do about that. But if you ask your question through the GoTo Webinar system, we will see all of your questions, and hopefully we'll have time um, uh, to answer all of those questions. Um, I would like to just say one thing before I uh, hand over to uh, uh, to David and to Matt, which is I think we probably need to declare a little bit of a, uh, of, a, of an interest in these um, in these two organisations. Fair, uh, Fair Banking um, has been a, a client of, of, of Zien's on and off uh, through the years. We've done uh, research work with Fair Banking. We haven't done any for a little while, but we uh, have on more than one occasion done um, uh, uh, done research for them. Um, and uh, uh, UCAS, we have an interest as well, and an ongoing interest. Michael Minelli, my uh, business partner and the chairman of Zien, is a non-executive director of, uh, of UCAS. Um, uh, th this is actually part and parcel of, um, of quite a lot of work that Zien uh, does and that uh, I personally have done. I haven't worked with either of these organizations, uh, but we do a lot of work in the standard space. And I've done a lot of strategic work with, for example, the Marine Stewardship, Council and uh, the program for the endorsement of forestry certification schemes um, over the years and British Safety Council um, and, 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 and so forth. So standards bodies is something that, that, that means a lot to Zien and we've been very heavily involved with them. Um, so uh, that's all the more reason for me to be thrilled to, to, to get these two organizations uh, together and to hear from both of the chief executives um, in one session. So um, let me please um, hand over initially to uh, David Coe, who will talk to you about the Fair Banking Foundation. Okay. Good morning, everybody, and um, welcome to the seminar. And I'm very happy to give you a brief introduction to the Fair Banking Foundation and our accreditation scheme. Um, basically, the Fair Banking Foundation is a charity dedicated to encouraging and helping financial providers to improve the well-being of their customers. The genesis really was the banking crisis of 2008-9 um, and um, the sort of knowledge that uh, banks weren't really treating their customers in the best possible way at that time. Our key service is our certification scheme, the Fair Banking Mark which is the only financial mark recognized by the UK Accreditation Service, UCAS. 
Our methodology is based on the drivers of financial well-being and money management practices that help customers positively change behavior. Our marks cover current accounts, personal loans, savings accounts, and credit cards. Products receive a mark on a range from three to five stars based on a very robust assessment and in-depth customer survey. We also operate an advisory service, consultancy, and uh, we've produced many seminal reports over the years, such as our current accounts ratings report and Save As You Borrow. Uh, Fair Banking today, we have 31 institutions with a mark, 20 million plus customers are using a product with a mark, 44 individual products with a mark, and 34 of those have five-star uh, Fair Banking marks. We just completed our 10th anniversary back in October and uh, had a lovely networking event in uh, the House of Commons members dining room. And uh, just looking back to last October, I mean, of course, uh, that's something that we just couldn't have done this year. So um, thankfully we were able to uh, get that in before COVID hit. Um, essentially, to get a fair banking mark, uh, we go through um, a product rating based on an initial application form, take customers' views, undertake research and evaluation of the product, a report is submitted to our assessment panel, and uh, then the fair bank banking mark is granted to the successful applicant. Um, a little bit more detail on that, uh, in terms of product rating, our methodology is to analyze the product features and make sure that um, they actually work in practice. And uh, we're benchmarking products against the identified drivers of financial well-being and money management practices. The second bit, the customer's view, is a really important part of our process because on the one hand, we're um, testing all the features uh, and making sure that in use, um, that, you know, that, that uh, they work effectively and also that customers are using them. Finally, a qualified product assessor will review the product descriptions, operational procedures, promotional material, and other relevant materials to understand how the product works. And uh, we will normally uh, visit the um, organization as well. Uh, although in COVID times, that's been a virtual visit. Finally, the report goes to the assessment panel and the fair banking mark is granted. Here then you can see all our various um, specifications. I won't labor them, but uh, we have current account with or without overdraft, credit cards, uh, children's savings, personal loans with high APR, regular savings, student current account, mortgages specification, personal loan specification, and um, that really covers the whole uh, gamut of our, our product range at the moment. I think as overall trends, we've seen less demand from large financial institutions over the last few years. I think there's a sense that um, modern digital banking offers many of the fairness components that were non-existent several years ago. And also uh, FCA requirements cover many of the original certification elements these days. On the other hand, we, get, we are getting much more demand from credit unions. And um, I think it's really a key part of their um, operations to give confidence to the um, consumer that their products are fair and reasonable. And um, also it's useful for their own purposes, which we'll look at in a minute. Um, credit unions follow the same certification process as high street banks and up till now credit unions have gained marks for personal loans uh, but we currently have four or five more going through with savings as well as loan products so that's quite exciting for us. Since 2015 we've certified uh, 27 credit unions and that means we have nearly 10% of credit unions with fair banking marks now. All to date have received five star ratings. And I think that really underlines how good and how fair uh, their um, loan products are. 
when we move into savings or current accounts, we're going to see credit unions getting lower ratings, three and four stars. And that's largely because at the moment, uh, the technology hasn't kept up um, with everything else, and they're not able to offer, op offer all the features that would get, gain them a four or five star rating. Again, the assessment pro process is exactly the same, visiting the organization. There's probably more working with them to ensure their products meet the specification before they ever uh, go to the panel. And really helping them improve their systems and processes, assessing their data, taking them through the same Ipsos Mori in-depth customer survey. And um, I think one thing we've noted with credit unions is, most of them, even when granting a loan, will insist on a face-to-face -face meeting, even if it's an online application. And that practice really ensures um, that economic abuse is um, minimized and that they really get an appreciation of the customer's uh, overall well-being. And they could tell, for example, if um, an applicant seemed very stressed or um, coerced, for example, perhaps by another family member. So looking at loans in particular, uh, we make sure the customer borrows an amount they can afford, that uh, repayment, including early repayment, is easy, that there are adequate tools and prompts for the customer so they can see what happens if they do repay early, if they want to extend the loan, that the organization is able to deal with change of circumstances, and that's particularly important, of course, in the um, days of COVID and um, current economic circumstances, uh, that the loan product encourages saving as you borrow, as um, that's been shown to be a great way to get people to uh, save up a nest egg for emergencies or a rainy day, and also that uh, they can consolidate other loans within uh, this low interest loan. I think the benefits we found of accreditation for the credit union is systemic improvements across product data and systems through working with us. It's been really important uh, for them to know that they are as good as a high street bank, which was a little bit surprising um, for us, but that really came out as one of the uh, key factors when we did research. Uh, it gives the credit union confidence when they're applying for their own finance. And they find it uh, very useful for lobbying their local MP or perhaps at uh, national level as well. Here you just see some examples of the fair banking mark on um, credit unions websites and how they're using it to underpin consumer confidence. Okay, um, before I close, I'd just like to touch on um, another innovative and interesting way we've used accreditation. And that is the sort of uh, self-accreditation by customers. Um, basically, we introduced three web-based apps or tools, as they're sometimes called, uh, mainly for use by consumer advisors and um, housing association advisors, systems advice, that type of client. And tool one really enables um, a client with or without a, an advisor to um, get a, a sort of uh, rating of their financial well-being. And um, we take them through a questionnaire that looks at, do they have a financial plan? Are they saving? What their main financial concerns are, job, health, relationship, who they go to for advice, how many banks they use, um, because people in financial difficulty often tend to um, you know, uh, trade off one credit card against another with free credit periods, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how they bank, whether they bank in person, uh, what they think about their bank's communications and overall charges. At the end of that, um, they get an assessment and um, it lists the places they might go for advice. And the respondent can share his or her results with the advisor 
as a basis for an advice session if they so wish. Tool two then is really where um, we've used our accreditation uh, directly for a client or respondent and people can uh, rate their own bank account using our criteria. Obviously, if we've already rated your bank account, then you don't need to do this. But for example, if you've got a bank that we don't provide a mark for, um, we found this is a really useful tool uh, for people to um, rate their bank account and really assess if that's um, a sort of problem area uh, that they need help on. So again, um, it's really a case of the uh, client playing a fair banking and um, using exactly the same criteria we would use to award a mark to a current account. And the app tells you at the end if the current account is offering a good deal for the customer or not. Uh, you can share the results with the advisor and of course, uh, take action. Um, it covers banking habits, uh, whether you bank online or through branch, uh, functionality, support, interest rates for overdrafts, uh, complaints and how they're handled, what alerts and other tools are available for budgeting, blocking types of payment, e.g. gambling, or if I want to block, uh, stop myself buying alcohol, uh, and then gives you that overall assessment. Tool three, um, very simply, just to complete the suite, uh, really is for setting goals for behavioral change. So in that, you would say um, from the advice session, uh, I want to move my bank account, I want to start saving, uh, or, or um, whatever else has been identified. And uh, tool three enables you to set those goals and have a reminder at whatever period um, you set for review. So that could be three months, six months, et cetera. Um, okay, I think I've covered that slide uh, very well. Again, you can share that with the advisor and the advisor, of course, can come back at the end of the uh, time frame and review your progress or otherwise. So um, just summing up, those tools derived from accreditation, uh, they were a set of tools for use by consumer advisors. Tool one sets the scene and provides a basis for discussion. Tool two provides feedback on a client's bank account as that was quite often identified as a problem area for people. And tool three provides goal setting, a plan and a reminder to the client at the end of the timeframe they've selected. Um, just quickly touching on our future plans, we're planning a major conference and consultation exercise with credit unions this autumn, uh, really because um, so far credit unions have been um, voraciously sort of consuming our current products, but we really want to know if there's something better we could um, offer them. Perhaps it's a form of corporate certification where we look at their whole operation and come up with a rating or it might be uh, other um, services or um, certification products uh, that they would find useful but given that everything has been sort of led by our current product range we think it's really important to actually go through that consultation exercise and find out what credit unions would like in a perfect world okay thank you very much that's all for me. Um, David, thank you very much. And um, we're now going to hear from Matt Gantley from uh, UCAS, which is the uh, UK accreditation service that provides the accreditation for fair banking and many, many others, as you will hear. Hmm. Matt. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. May I first of all say thank you to the Financial Services Club for this opportunity to speak about a topic that we believe adds real tangible benefit to the UK economy and has a valuable role to play for government, for public enterprise, including financial and professional services. As Ian and David have mentioned, my name is Matt Gantley. I'm the Chief Executive of the United Kingdom Accreditation Service, which is the government appointed body, uh, national accreditation body for the whole of the United Kingdom. 
And I'd like to speak to you for about 10 minutes to first of all clarify what accreditation is, why it matters, especially in the context of mutual recognition and f facilitating business and trade. I'd like to explain who we are and where we fit into the UK's national quality infrastructure and what our governance is. And along the way, I'll give you some examples of accreditation in action. And of course, we've already heard from the Fair Banking Foundation of how accreditation works, uh, accredited certification works uh, for financial services. And of course, at the end, we'll have opportunity for any uh, answer to any questions you may have. So I'd love to hear from you and any comments and any feedback. So first of all, why does accreditation matter? And as this, these pictures show, which is a, a video you might want to have a look at um, on YouTube, at work, at home and at play, accreditation matters um, because alongside standards, it is the hidden infrastructure that ensures that we can be confident in our daily lives from the moment that we wake up in our bed where the materials are tested for fire safety, to our breakfast and the quality of the water in our kettle, to the food safety of the butter on our toast, from the emissions uh, of our cars and the calibration of our speed cameras, to the integrity of construction products in our workplaces and the methods of safety in our sports venues, to the anti-doping testing of athletes. These are just, just some of the many thousands of ways in which standards and accreditation protect and improve our lives. In these thousands of ways, we can be confident at home and play that the products and services that we use are safe, legal and secure and sustainable because that, because of standards and accreditation. So where do we see these signs of assurance? We see them in several ways, including a range of certification marks. We've already heard about the, the Fair Banking Foundation, but also the BSI Kite mark or the UL mark or the CE marking for designated products that are sold in the European Union, which attest to appropriate levels of health, safety and environmental standards. UCAS is the hidden assurance behind brands such as the Red Tractor Farm Assurance Scheme, the Gas Safety Register, the British Retail Consortium Global Standards, ISO 9000 Quality Standards. So accreditation applies not just to the quality of products, but also applies equally to services, as we've already seen from Fair Banking. The United Kingdom Accreditation Service is the final stamp of approval that testing, inspection and certification and verification is done so competently, consistently and impartially. The United Kingdom Crown and Tick is well respect, respected around the world, so much so that there are just as many UCAS accredited test reports and inspection certificates outside the UK in locations such as China, Japan and the Middle East as there are in the United Kingdom itself. So what is accreditation? Well, accreditation technically defined is a pr procedure by which an authoritative body such as UCAS gives a formal recognition that a body or a, com uh, a conformity assessment body is competently carrying out that specific task. So that could be applied very, very broadly. And as we can see from this slide, it is the formal independent recognition of competence of conformity assessment bodies to, to perform specific conformity assessment tasks. Those tasks include testing, inspection, certification, as we've seen in the case of the Fair Banking Foundation, and also increasingly the validation of data and the verification of, of claims, as we see, for example, in the EU emissions trading scheme. These conformity assessment bodies are evalu evaluated against a range of international standards, as we can see from the box on the right, which provides a consistent global framework to allow testing, inspection and certification to be recognized globally especially across trade borders. For example, certification against the international standard 17021 is one of the largest accreditation standards and schemes. For example, for over 1.1 million businesses across the world certified to ISO 9001. Next slide, next slide please. One of the ways to understand accreditation is to think of it as a final level of control before government. UCAS is appointed by the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy to deliver this essential public authority activity and a public service role. Throughout the hierarchy, uh, international and national standards underpin the evaluation process. As a minimum, we evaluate the competence and conformity assessment bodies on an annual basis. And the overall assessment program for each of those conformity assessment bodies is, is based upon the inherent risk and the requirements of the appropriate standard to ensure that they are competent and impartial. 
for the sole purpose to ensure that government, consumers, enterprise purchasers can be confident within their supply chains and assured that ultimately that they have trust in the quality, the legality, the safety of the products and services that we, we all use. Next slide, please. So as you can see from this slide, accreditation is part of a national accreditation, regional and global network that comes together for the purpose of mutual recognition to ensure there is international equivalence and acceptance and the removal of technical barriers to trade. In other words, when a product or a service is tested, inspected or certified once, it is accepted all around the world, reducing the amount of administration and supporting trade. UCAS is a regional member of EA, the European Body for Accreditation, and IAF, the International Body for Certification, and ILAC for Inspection and Testing. What is important to remember from this slide is that there are over 102 accreditation bodies, and in all major countries across the world, in 102 countries across the world, there is one national accreditation body, which is that final step of authority before government, providing that public authority activity. So mutual recognition agreements cover all of the major areas of conformity assessment across all of the major uh, economies of the world. What's important to note is that the number of laboratories, inspection and certification bodies is more than enough to cover the broad range of products and services that can be accredited. With over 60,000 accreditation accredited laboratories across the world and over 8,000 certification bodies. And because of that valuable role we play to the UK and global economy, organisations such as OECD and the World Trade Organisation and the World Banking Group have worked very closely with accreditation bodies to develop mutual recognition and understanding the development of, of accreditation. And if you, if you show the next slide, please, Morgan, we can see that there are many uh, independently validated uh, reports which show the way in which uh, the, the role of accreditation, for example, uh, through independent research done by BSI, the British Standards Institute, it was shown that standards contribute to 37.4% uh, of UK productivity growth and 28% uh, percent of annual GDP growth can be attributed to standards equivalent to 8.2 billion at uh, 2014 prices. So accreditation standards play a really important role. Um, next slide, please. But first of all, let's take a step back uh, and especially into the real world to remember that beyond economics, uh, the economic benefits, accreditation and standards are essential to ensuring health, health and safety and quality. And when is this process is sidestepped, as we saw earlier on in the, the COVID-19 crisis with uh, PPE being delivered into the country that was then uh, rejected, that didn't meet the appropriate UK and European standards, it meant that there, there was a significant amount of waste of time and effort at a critical time, and especially to ensure that the health and safety and the well-being of key workers uh, is not put at risk. And so that fundamentally is one of the key reasons we need to ensure that accreditation is properly applied. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we're appointed into this uh, public authority role by government, and we work closely with uh, many government departments, but we are entirely independent from government and self-financing. This allows us to, to be an important tool for government and also the free market, so that we balance the considerations of both, both government and market-driven solutions, allowing greater flexibility and more cost-effective solutions for industry regulation. This could be particularly useful for the financial and uh, professional services as an alternative to government regulation. Next slide, please. So this slide shows some examples of the ways in which we've worked with government to provide a flexible solution to evaluating competence uh, from the forensic sector to healthcare to food safety standards. We work together with many different government bodies to ensure that there's appropriate level of, of standards. Next slide, please. So a little bit about, about our background, We've, we can trace our history back for 54 years, uh, but we were consolidated in 25 years ago. We did over 33,000 assessments and we have a team of 190 assessors with over 700 technical experts. And they include the civil engineers, the physicists, the farm insurance specialists, ensuring we have that industry technical specialism to evaluate the compliance across all the very broad range of products and services. Next slide, please. A key aspect of why we, we deliver our role in the way that we do is because of our governance. We're a company limited by guarantee and we, have, uh, we don't have shareholders, we have guarantors and they come across four different colleges, government departments, as you'll see. 
customer groups, business and membership organizations, for example, CBI, uh, for the largest organizations and the Federation of Small Businesses for smaller businesses, as well as professional institutes, many of which I'm sure you'll recognize. Next slide, please. So David has given us an excellent introduction to the Fair Banking uh, Foundation, but I also wanted to mention there are many other areas of financial and professional services where we're working to develop uh, uh, options Options that are uh, alternatives to government regulation, but which support the work of regulators to manage uh, quality standards within uh, within industry. For example, we're working with the Gambling Commission on the accuracy of gambling machines, anti-bribery management systems, ethical behaviour uh, in the financial planners, as well as a whole range of standards on green finance strategy. So, in in summary. We are, we're building strong links across industry, particularly the financial services and professional services industry. We'd like to thank you very much for your time, and we hope that's given you a good overview of the work of UCAS, and we'd be delighted to, to discuss that with you now. And I'll hand back to Ian. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so very much. Um, really appreciate your uh, time, um, in fact, both of you. Um, uh, we have Several questions have uh, have come in while uh, while you were talking, which is what we wanted. Um, but just before we go on to the questions, I would like to introduce Kerry Randall, who is actually joining us, although you can't see him. Um, uh, he is uh, now part of this panel. Um, Kerry is the UCAS assessment uh, manager who looks after the Fair Banking Foundation. Um, so uh, we might well find uh, with one or two of these questions that are um, sort of across both uh, UCAS and Fair Banking that uh, uh, David and Matt would like to uh, defer to Kerry for the uh, for some uh, specific answers. I'm very grateful to Kerry for for joining us just to to help to make sure that we can address all of your questions as 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 part of this panel. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, in in fact, the first of these uh, the questions I'd like to come to um, is a two part question from Matthew in Southampton. Um, who'd like to know a little bit more about um, how desirable money management practices have been identified and perhaps how these might be changing um, in our changing times. And there's a supplementary question to this, which is specific, which maybe um, uh, either David or, 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 or uh, Kerry or both of you could answer, mm. uh, which is, could you explain what Savers You Borrow is, is about? Please. Okay. Mm. David, maybe you'd like to go first. Yeah, sure. Um, well, you talked about desirable money management practices. I think um, the real shift has been twofold. Uh, on the one hand, it's been about providing the the um, consumer with tools and um, mm -hmm. information so that they can properly manage their account. So, you know, uh, some of the things I touched on would be being able to block payments to um, gambling, for example, if, if um, that was an issue, or stop yourself purchasing alcohol. So blocking types of payment that you would make. Um, the other things are really about budgeting tools. Um, does your bank account enable you to have all the information so you can see your expenditure by category uh, and you can really plan your finances m much more effectively? Um, and another example of that would be on the saving side um, so that you can actually save um, in particular pots. So, for example, I have my holiday pot, I'd have my uh, motor repair pot or whatever pots I want to send up for my savings goals. My wedding, pot, for example, that would be fun, but um, probably uh, not relevant in my case, at least. Um, so the, the, those are all the sort of, I suppose, trends in money management, really, um, practices that, that uh, the banks have introduced. And um, I think, you know, it's partially because of all the impetus that we've given them through certification. And also, um, again, I touched on very briefly the sort of onset of digital banking. Um, and therein lies the huge challenge in the banking world because um, if I bank digitally, well, how can the bank actually execute their um, duty of care, uh, particularly towards vulnerable customers? And I think that's the challenge for this moment in time. Um, save as you borrow was the second part of that question. And um, literally, that means that in order to get a loan from uh, those credit unions, 
um, or indeed some banks would encourage you rather than make it mandatory. Um, but they are either saying, you know, we strongly encourage you to um, set aside a savings pot uh, whilst you have a loan um, term outstanding. Uh, in some of the cases of credit unions, they're actually saying this is a condition of um, getting a loan. And um, of course, the consumer has to be warned that that extends the loan by a little bit. Um, but we believe from research we've done that the benefit far outweighs the um, slight extra additional costs in terms of interest and term length. That's, uh, that's really interesting and a very, very comprehensive answer. David Carey, is there anything you would like to, uh, to add to that, that answer from the point of view of the uh, Fair Banking's products and, 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 and how you assess them? Uh, from the, the perspective of the UCAS assessment, um, having um, elements such as, as the um, savers you borrow within the fair banking's technical specifications. So those are the uh, the criteria that the banking products are assessed against. Um, really is, is key to um, showing how um, the certification schemes that have been developed align with the charitable aims of, of fair banking and, and the organisation. So it, from our perspective, it, it helps to see that that joined up approach. It's, it's, um, it's really positive stuff. Mm -hmm. Ian, if I could just add to that, um, Please. So our, our, our role in this uh, in particular is it, whatever the standard might be, um, I mean, the, the best standards really are those that, that are uh, born from industry consensus, that have a broad stakeholder uh, development process, including, the, you know, where appropriate regulators, consumer bodies um so and and the industry itself and the, the certification bodies that be applying so all, everybody has a a role to ensure that the the requirement the standard it could be money management practices uh, embodies all of the concerns and to make sure that that scheme works effectively in practice in terms of certification and therefore when we have a good standard requirement um such as uh, the the fair banking foundation's uh, requirements we can ensure that the, that that standard is then upheld rigorously, consistently, and impartially. So that's fundamentally our role. Is we we don't develop the standard, although we can help to advise and support on the development of the standard. But we we ensure that those certification bodies deliver it rigorously, consistently, impartially, and ultimately, most importantly, competently over to, over time. So. That, that, that's 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 really helpful. Thank you. Before we move off this the, the, this this topic, there's a, a two part question from Bob McDowell. I'd like to focus on one part of it, which was to do with credit unions. Um, uh, and, and he says that credit unions are, are, are narrowly geographic in, in scope and scale of business. Do you think that they have a unique role to play um, in the post COVID recovery of consumer banking? Um, and, and, and where do we think that certification products of the, the fair banking kind or of the kind that UCAS is, um, is maybe arranging with other certification bodies, uh, where, 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 where does um, uh, accredita accreditation and certification standards fit in uh, with that? Uh, David, perhaps you'd like to go first. Sure. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think um, one of the things that's happened to credit unions during COVID is um, I guess because people have been furloughed or they've been getting the self-employed income supplement, um, they've actually seen their loan draw go down. And um, clearly, you know, that's a key part of their um, business model. And um, that's something that I think will swing right around at the end of um, furlough, uh, if that is indeed October or whether that gets extended or as people get more into debt. Um, for the moment, at least people um, on furlough or still in work um, are, you know, relatively solvent. Um, I think after that, people will start, uh, you know, um, finishing uh, spending their savings and will be going back um, for loans. And credit unions offer uh, low interest rates and um, they're capped. So, um, they can really be competitive uh, compared mm. to um, a high street bank. Um, are they geographically limited? Well, um, of course, we have credit unions that um, help various professions or, or trades. 
um, for example, Plane Saver that um, helps the whole sort of um, airline industry and um, think more of the sort of workers in airports rather than perhaps pilots, but I mean, ultimately it can help both. Um, we have NHS credit union, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So those aren't limited geographically. And um, I think most areas these days would probably uh, boast uh, one or two credit unions. So I think they will, will play a hugely important role um, by providing low cost credit uh, because they're not at the end of the day um, for-profit institutions and uh, their, their interest rates are limited and um, the, there is capacity there to certainly help post-COVID um, situation dramatically, yeah. Would uh, either uh, Kerry or Matt like to <coughs> comment on this one? Uh, I think as, as, from a, an accreditation perspective, I think uh, we, we'd welcome the, the growth of of standards in and consumer recognized certification in uh, the credit union of course across the, the the whole banking and credit card industry and, and insurance industry as well that uh, consumers want assurance that the organization that they're working with uh, the banking with or insured with it, or the lending money from is uh, ethical um, is fair, is is uh, is open, is transparent, has appropriate governance processes, and I think there's, a, there's an increasing demand from consumers for that, and so they're looking for those 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 brands of assurance, such as the Fair Banking Foundation, that 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 it is in place. They're, they're no longer satisfied that it's uh, just regulated by the FCA. They want to see that additional level of of, of assurance, but it can't just be self-assurance. It has to be an accredited. Uh, area so we're very keen to to promote and to grow of course the fair banking foundations work across a broader range of credit unions and banking services but also look to see there's other uh, certification marks out there that we would deal with specific issues in the marketplace we, 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 we need we need to start to wrap up and I've had a, a few questions have, have, have come in quite quite late in the in the day more than halfway through the the question and answer session which makes it very difficult for me to to, to webinar jockey the questions. Um, I'll try to combine these these, these questions because the second part of Bob's question was a was a fairly general question around um, you know these COVID times or difficult times for, for, for a lot of consumers. Do you see the uh, the bundle of, uh, of, of products that you're offering uh, uh, changing uh, you know on, on on the back of these changing times? And then two questions have come in, both of which mention. Um, uh, liquidity and derivatives and exotics uh, and, and the like, basically around the ethics of the uh, of financial services more more generally. Can you reconcile uh, what's happening with overdrafts with the the, the the trillions that are available in liquidity to cover derivatives and, and and exotics all happening within the same banking institutions at the same time? So that's that blend between sort of wholesale and, and retail. Can we look at retail? Um, uh, banking in, in, in isolation. And there's a second question along those lines that's come in at more, more or less exactly the same time. One was from Philip and the other was from F.G. Uterian, um, who's asking whether there uh, are international practices that we should be looking at. So we know that this is a UK-based accreditation, but again, looking at, thinking about derivatives and, and, and the like, do we need to take an international uh, perspective um, on these things in order to get to the to the trust issues and, and, and the ethics. So so sort of final comments really from, from all of you and apologies to those in the audience if we overrun by three or four minutes, but I think these are really interesting questions uh, for these people to address, David. Okay, well, um, we don't get into derivatives in any sense. And I mean, banks um, now have to separate their wholesale and retail operations. So. Um, we strictly deal with the consumer side. Um, I think a few things that we've been campaigning for is um, uh, extending the um, limit to um, interest rates uh, on overdraft uh, and saying this should be extended again past October because that's what we see as a really critical moment in time uh, when, as I said, um, I mean, research has been done by The Economist suggesting 40% of people on furlough will be made unemployed. So that's the time we see people becoming desperate for credit, uh, dipping into their overdraft because they may not ever have been in this situation before. So uh, we're saying there should be a cap of 25% interest um, 
on such overdraft facilities extending beyond the end of October as one measure. Um, I think, uh, yeah, the, the, the other side of that um, from international practice, I mean, clearly we would like to see um, the furlough scheme extended as they've done in Germany, even though that's not uh, quite in our remit. And um, again, we've been watching with interest uh, campaigns for universal basic income um, because of the scale of the crisis and what people will be facing um, in, the, in that COVID future until such time as the vaccine's available. David, thank you. Uh, Matt? Yeah, I just uh, add a few, a few quick points. Uh, the, especially on the international recognition, I think it's a very valid point. Uh, with the accreditation that uh, we have the Fair Banking Foundation, that is will, is internationally recognised because of the work that we we do uh, in our mutual recognition. So, uh, but of, of course, maybe the, the Fair Banking Foundation is focused on the United Kingdom market this time, but it will be internationally recognised in terms of the validity of that certificate. Um, yeah, you know, we, we primarily were focused on the retail side of this present time, but there's no there's no reason why there's there can be a scheme developed, standards requirements developed, and obviously in coordination with the FCA that there couldn't be a, a voluntary scheme uh, or connected to regulatory requirements to provide evidence of of compliance that that couldn't be developed under an accredited certification scheme. But um, there's many many parts a part of that process. Matt, thank you. Uh, Kerry, is there anything that you would like to, to add or do you think uh, David and Matt have, have, have covered this this point? I think that that's been nicely covered by David and Matt. I have nothing to add. Wonderful. Uh, many thanks to, to all three of you for, um, uh, for, for, for this panel. I'm, I'm now going to, to wrap up. Um, uh, as it were. So once again, I would like to thank our uh, sponsors for their forbearance and for their sponsorship. Um, this is the list of the FS Club sponsors. While this list stays up, I would also like to thank you, the audience, um, for um, your um, uh, signing up for this webinar and for your uh, attentiveness. I'm, I'm usually very strict about not overrunning. I just thought those last questions were so, were, were so intriguing and interesting. And I noticed that almost everybody stayed on the line to hear uh, to, to hear the answers to those, so I, I, I think I made the right, um, the right call there. Um, and um, uh, Morgan, if you can just move on to the next uh, slide, please. Um, I would just like to spend a few moments uh, letting you know about our forthcoming uh, webinars. Um, so. Uh, the day after tomorrow, we have Financial Centers of the World, uh, where we're going to be focusing on uh, Toronto. Um, on uh, Friday. Uh, risks in the boardroom. Are you making the right calls? That should be an interesting uh, uh, webinar as well. Next week, uh, we have the City of London and smaller international financial centres, cooperation, competition or collaboration um, on the 2nd of September. On the 3rd of September, if by any chance anybody is a, a fan of me hosting webinars, you get me again on could equity be used to replace a portion of, of an employee's um, salary. Uh, and on the uh, 7th of September, September uh, uh, Malcolm Hurlston will be uh, uh, leading a discussion on employee ownership and the future of capitalism. So, so lots to think about there. All that now remains is for me to thank our speakers and, um, and our panelists, Kerry, David, Matt, um, and Kerry, thank you very much. Under normal circumstances, there will be a rousing round of applause from the audience, but we don't have that. So instead, um, all that I can do is give you a little shake of the maracas. Which is the best that I can do, but I'm sure there's a very grateful audience out there who are um, e clapping away uh, to thank you once again for your time. So thanks everybody, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.